All right, welcome to Pines and Politics. We've been doing this for a few months. We've had some really interesting political conversations. I appreciate uh, everyone who's been, who's come multiple times. It's fun to look out in the crowd and start to recognize faces. Uh, and thank you to uh, Seth Bolton for joining us today, being willing. Uh, I have behind me, sorry, I'm, I'm on a chain. <laughs> We're tethered today. I have Caitlin Bird behind me, our political reporter at the Post and Courier, and I have Skyler, our political editor. Uh, this is a casual environment, but please let them ask the questions. They've collected some questions from uh, our readers, but uh, this will be a civil situation. Anyway, welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Autumn. Um, I'm going to let my boss start because I'm smart. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start with introduction and go right into some questions, and then we'll finish with a lightning round. We'll ask uh, some of your questions from the audience, and then we'll give the congressman the last word. Uh, Seth Moulton is a Democratic congressman from the 6th District of Massachusetts, which is anchored north of Boston, around Salem, Lynn, and the state's upper coast. He was first elected to Congress in 2014, uh, but we'll go back in time. 9-11 uh, happened just a few months after his graduation from Harvard. He joined the Marine Corps, and in 2003, he was an infantry platoon commander in the 1st Company Marine Center, Baghdad, during the Second Gulf War. He served four tour tours of duty and was awarded uh, two medals of valor. Uh, after his service concluded, he went to Harvard Business School on the GI Bill and uh, worked in the private sector in Texas building the country's first high-speed railway, which was the Texas Central Railway. Shift over here. Uh, in Congress, he serves on the Armed Services Committee and he is an outspoken supporter of gun control, getting an F rating from the National Rifle Association. He supports uh, an assault rifle ban and mandatory background checks for all firearm purchases. He's also a tad late in joining the field, entering uh, in April, um, just a week before uh, Joe Biden did. Uh, in addition to being outspoken on the conduct of President Trump, he did make an unsuccessful attempt to oust Nancy Pelosi as uh, a House leader. Uh, Moulton lives in Salem with his wife and family. Uh, one thing I did notice on your uh, webpage there is a very prominent picture there of James Smith, who was our South Carolina Democratic nominee for governor last year. Um, so there must be a connection there with the military somehow. Well, absolutely. I was very proud to support James in that race, and I was very proud to be hosted by him and his wife at their home a few months ago. It's great to be here. Thank there you very go. much for, for having me. It's, and you, uh, can, you can respond, you guys. <laughs> you can respond. There we go. <laughs> I'm glad to be one of the one of the early participants in Pines and Politics. I, I um, you guys have quite a scheme going here, where the two interviewers don't have beer, but the interviewer uh, for now. does. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what kind of uh, position that puts me in, but uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Let's start with the obvious question: Are you still running for president? Very much still running for president. Uh, are you still reporting? I am. <laughs> Look, uh, I'm an underdog in this race, and, and I totally get that. You know, I, I did get in late. Um, uh, getting in late's, you know, been a, been a bit of a, a bigger handicap than we expected. You know, on a personal level, I mean, I, I have a 10-month-old daughter at home, which just wasn't an option to get in earlier, so I don't have any regrets about that. Uh, but I, I will say that, you know, everywhere I go, the response I get is, we want to have this voice in this race. There are 25 candidates, there's only one combat veteran during the longest war in American history, we want to hear from you. Uh, there's only one presidential candidate in American history who's actually talked about mental health on a personal level and has an ambitious plan to make sure everybody in America gets the mental health care that they need. And so those are some of the things that, that we're talking about. And fundamentally, I'm willing to take on Donald Trump, not just as president, but as commander in chief. And that's important because he is failing in his fundamental duty to keep us safe, both at home and abroad. It also happens to be where I think he's weakest. So if you think Donald Trump is going to be easy to beat, then hey, don't worry. But if you think he's going to be tough to beat, which, which I actually do, then we've got to be willing to take him on where he's weakest. We've got to be able to take him on, not just in his presidential duties and his domestic policies, but in his, in his duty as the commander-in-chief 
to keep us all safe and secure. And I think that from the gun violence we've seen around America, the domestic terrorism that he, he refuses to even acknowledge, to his support for our enemies around the globe. Putin, Kim Jong-un, the way that he cozies up to the greatest adversaries of America today, and, and then shuns our allies, he is failing in that duty. And Democrats have got to respond with a strong position on national security, on foreign policy, with a plan for next generation defense that will keep America safe and strong for years to come. And that's what I'm bringing to this race. We'll have a follow-up, let's go. Uh, You are stating that you're in the race to win it, but you are polling at zero in the 34 qualifying polls. The DNC is using the German debate. Like in the, look, there were three qualifying polls required for the second debate, and I poll, I met the polling criteria in 12. They were just ones the DNC didn't choose to, to call. I mean, there was a CNN national poll that came out this morning that had me ahead of five people in this race, including two senators. So look, I mean, you, you can quibble about the polling, but I get the fact that I'm an underdog, they, that's okay. You know, in my first race for Congress, I got in against an 18-year incumbent. Uh, I obviously didn't know much about politics because I didn't know that you weren't supposed to run against 18-year incumbents. And I took him on because I thought we could do better in Massachusetts. I thought that I had seen some of the consequences of failed leadership in Washington. And I said, we need the voice of a veteran to make sure that what we saw in Iraq doesn't happen again. So I got in this, that race. And the Massachusetts Democratic establishment said, Seth, not only are you going to lose, but you'll never be involved in Massachusetts politics again because you've dared to take on the establishment. And they were wrong, of course. They were telling this young combat veteran, do not participate in the democracy you just risked your life to defend. But I will say they were right about how tough a race it would be. And in the first poll that we did, was seven months in, I was 53 points down. So that's a lot worse than the polling statistics you're citing because I'm, I'm not even 53 points behind Biden at this point and he's, in, he's far ahead of the field. But we kept at it because the response on the ground was very positive. And I ended up winning that primary by 11 and winning a tough general election by, by 14. So um, I interrupted your question, but I just wanna be clear that, you know, there's only so much you can read into the polling. Well, given all of that then, but that's fine in Massachusetts now, but what is your path forward in a state like South Carolina? You know, in a state like South Carolina, I think that, that, that Democrats want to hear from the perspective of someone who's fought in these wars, the perspective of someone who has a way to move America forward that's not sort of, you know, the, the far left politics that some of the people in this primary are, are practicing that don't appeal to the majority of uh, Americans. If we're going to win this race, we have got to build a big coalition, a coalition that includes everybody in the Democratic Party, plus independent voters, those Obama-Trump voters, and even some disaffected Republicans. Building that coalition is not going to be easy, but that's exactly the job that I had on the ground in Iraq, literally leading troops in combat, taking this incredibly diverse group of Americans from all over the country, different backgrounds, different beliefs, different, different religious perspectives, different political persuasions, and getting them all united behind a common mission to serve America. And I think that's exactly the kind of leadership experience we need from the next nominee and for the next Commander-in-Chief of the United States. So that's what I offer to South Carolina voters, and, um, and I think that that matters um, as we talk about who is going to, to sit in the Oval Office and provide you know, hopefully a return to some moral leadership for our country. So we've been doing this special feature at every event, and it's your 90-second question, okay? And we're gonna time it. I have my phone out, specifically. Uh, so in 90 seconds, we're asking candidates who sit down with us to give us their plan for their first 100 days. So 90 seconds, first 100 days. Go. And go. Everyone can check behind me. Go ahead. The most important thing that our Democratic nominee has to do to win, but also the most important thing that the next president needs to do if we're going to accomplish anything, is to bring this country together. I'm only 40 years old, but I've never seen America more divided than it is today. That's why it's going to be hard to build that coalition we need to win. 
And that's why the next president is going to have a challenge to accomplish all the great things that every Democratic candidate in this race wants to accomplish. So in my first 100 days, I will visit every state in the country and hold a town hall. And I will start with the states where I got the fewest votes. I'll start with the reddest states. And I will listen. I will go to America and I will listen. When I was first elected to Congress, I held more town halls than any other Democrat in the Congress, in the House or the Senate. And I think that's important to doing the job of being an elected representative. You've got to listen to Americans to be able to understand where you can find some common ground and bring them together. We can have great plans for health care, for, for national service, as I do, for mental health care, for wherever else you want to talk about. But if we can't find some unity in this country, we're not going to get anything accomplished. And that will be my number one priority on day one. We did it. One minute, 22 seconds. I didn't use all my time. Do you want eight more seconds? You can have it. You can have eight more seconds. No, it's all good. It's all good. I think you were four seconds longer than Senator Kovachov. I think so, so, yeah. She came in at like 119 or something. We're going to have to start keeping track of that. Um, you may be best known for your ill-fated attempt at trying to stop Nancy Pelosi from becoming House Speaker. What were you trying to do there, and do you regret it today? I absolutely don't regret it, because we need a new generation of leadership in America. And, 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 that, and that includes our Democratic Party. And, and by the way, this was not just an effort to ask Pelosi. This was, a, this was an acknowledgment that the entire Democratic leadership has been in our firm. has been in power for a combined total of about 100 years. And, and, and look, I have great respect for Pelosi and the others. And, and so do everybody else. As well on that list? Look, the, the whole crew. And I have great respect for them. But we face a new generation of challenges in America. And I, I think it's, a time, it's time for the generation that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan to step in for the generation that sent us there. I think it's time for the generation that's going to have to deal with the effects of climate change to step in for the generation that got us here. I think it's time for the generation that, that's got to find jobs in this new automated economy, this automated revolution that's sweeping this country and putting a lot of people out of work, to take over for the generation that kind of got us through the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. So when the Senate you know, tries to regulate social media and can't understand how Facebook works, we, we got a problem. And it's just time for some new ideas. So I spent the last two years working as hard as anyone to flip the house. My Serve America organization supported half of the candidates who won seats from Republicans to take back Democratic control of the house. And many of those were veterans. I went around recruiting, supporting, endorsing, campaigning for them on the ground. I went to places that a lot of Democrats don't go. Connor Lamb in Western Pennsylvania only invited four Democrats to come campaign for them, for him. And I was one of them. Amy McGrath, who's now taking on Senator Mitch McConnell down in Kentucky. She only invited two. She said, she said, I'm only inviting Joe Biden and Seth Moulton to come campaign for me down in Kentucky because I know that a lot of Democrats aren't popular down here, but this is the place that we need to win. And, you know, going to all those places and seeing, you know, all the diversity of Americans that we've got to, to represent. Um, it really inspired me to say, we need some change in Washington, that the establishment is not getting this job done. And everywhere I go on this campaign trail, I sometimes get this um, critique or question from reporters, but I have yet to meet a single voter who says, you know, Seth, I just wish you'd follow what the party bosses in Washington say a little bit more. Why can't you just be a little bit more of an establishment guy? That's not what America needs. You're not the only Massachusetts politician in the race. Uh, how do you get out of Senator Elizabeth Warren's shadow? Well, look, we have different politics. Um, I have a lot of respect for Senator Warren, and she's done great things, but um, you know, I have, a, I have a politics of unity, of working across the aisle to get things done. When I first got to Congress, I I took over for a, a congressman who had passed one bill in 18 years. And I said, we can do better than that. And part of the reason he hasn't gotten a lot done is because he's too divisive. He's too partisan. 
And so I immediately started finding Republicans that I could work with. And as a result of that, the first bill I passed, the Faster Care for Veterans Act, got through a very divided Congress, Republican Senate, you know, got signed into law, and now veterans have a lot better access to scheduling their appointments at the VA. And that's the kind of just hard work that you've got to put in across the aisle to get things done. So um, I have a lot of respect for um, you know, Senator Warren and her, her, her liberal credentials, but I think that we've got to have a politics of unity, a politics that's focused on getting things done for the American people. That's the kind of leadership that, that's the kind of leadership experience I have coming out of the Marines. Because in the Marines, it wasn't about Democrats versus Republicans. You know, it wasn't about how strident you could be. It, it was about finding common ground and putting differences aside to serve our country. You've also called for impeaching President Trump. How would you build a case, especially after the uh, Trump administration dismissed the findings of the Mueller report? And what specific articles or violations or offenses can you cite that he's done that would hold up in the court? Well, first of all, Mueller laid out a very clear case for how he's obstructed justice. Um, he's violated the emoluments cause of the Constitution. He's fundamentally failed in his duties as commander in chief. I mean, if, if, if President Obama treated Putin the way Trump has treated him, does anyone honestly believe that he wouldn't be under impeachment proceedings? I mean, give me a break, okay? So this guy broke the law. In the, in the Constitution of the United States, it's very simple. If the President of the United States breaks the law, that holds impeachment proceedings. So I get the argument. Do you want to take time for a second? We can do this. We'll switch for a second. Switch, all right. So, so, so I get the argument from Speaker Pelosi and other leaders in our party that the politics of impeachment are tough. You know, that it might uh, make the 2020 election more difficult. I mean, I don't personally agree with that, but, but that's not the point. The point is that I swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Not the politics of my party, not the prospects of the 2020 election, the Constitution of the United States. And nobody in America is above the law. When the President violates the Constitution, when the President breaks the law, there's a very simple remedy, we hold impeachment proceedings. And that's why I was the first candidate in this entire race to just stand up for the Constitution and say this is the right thing to do even if the politics are tough. So that's all. I rest my case. I'm going to try not to. We're going to limbo. We can do that, yeah. Sorry, guys. We're still learning how to do this whole thing. Obviously, I'm a print reporter. I'm not a broadcast girl. Um, <laughs> we're going to retire this. We can retire that way, and we'll pass it. Um, so because you have not qualified for any of the Democratic debates to date, we would like to give you the opportunity uh, to ask you two questions, one from each of those debates. Sure. We're gonna play by the same rules. You'll get 60 seconds to respond just as your yeah. colleagues did. Um, the first question being, how would you address income inequality? Income, in, income inequality in America is a fundamental problem because this is a country of equal opportunity. You know, America is not a country of equal results, but it is a country with the fundamental value of equal opportunity. So I have a tax plan called A Chance to Succeed. And, and what my tax plan does is it says that everybody in America needs to pay their fair share. It does not set the poor versus the wealthy. It does not say that businesses or corporations are necessarily evil. It just says that you're gonna pay a fair share. And that will do a lot to reduce income inequality in America. Because it means that everybody will get a chance to have a decent life, to have a decent income, to, to, to succeed in this economy. How many of you in the audience today paid more than a dollar in taxes last year? A, a few people? So, so, so all of you, actually, just scratch that, just <coughs> you, Heath, you alone, you alone paid more in taxes than Amazon and Netflix and Delta Airlines combined. Now, you don't have to, that doesn't make these companies necessarily evil. I mean, you know, they're exploiting the tax laws, right? But give me a break. That's absurd. That's an absurd system. Why on earth should you, you know, Heath and your sandals and lacrosse shorts pay 
more, pay more in taxes than these massive multi-billion dollar corporations. It doesn't make sense. When you say fair share, can you be specific, like, does that look like an even percentage across the board, or are you talking about it in consonant with income that people earn? I mean, when you say fair share, it sounds nice, but it's not very specific. Can you give I us some specific. specific? I'm happy to share the specifics. So it means the corporate tax rate goes back up to 25, not where it was, because it was a little bit too high, but from 21 up to 25. It means that the long-term capital gains rate is the same as the ordinary income rate. So if you're sitting on Wall Street trading money for a living, <coughs> you're gonna have to pay the same rate as people who are you know, doing a, doing a, tough, uh, doing a tough job here in, in South Carolina. And, um, and it means that we're gonna close loopholes on, uh, on corporations because you know, look, I get the fact that there's an economic rationale behind Amazon not paying anything in taxes. But the way they're able to do that is through a lot of loopholes that just shouldn't exist. So it doesn't mean Amazon is breaking the law, but they're exploiting the law, and that's gotta end. We're gonna move to the second question, which came from the second round of debates. Why are you the best candidate to heal the racial divide in America? You know, I'm fortunate to be in a field with an awful lot of talented candidates. And there are an awful lot of people who bring different experiences to this, this debate and this campaign that, um, that we show here. But I'm the only candidate with the experience of actually leading Americans on the ground in some of the most difficult and divisive circumstances on Earth. And when I had to lead troops in Iraq, in a war that I was an outspoken critic of, in a war that you know, probably half of my Marines disagreed with, I had to bring together Americans of all different racial backgrounds, different political beliefs, different religious beliefs, different ideas about the war, different ideas about why they were there, and get them united behind a common mission. And I think that is exactly the leadership challenge of the next president, to get Americans united behind a common mission, not to make America great again, to go back to some mythic past that's never really existed, but to make this country better than it's ever been before. And I'm the only candidate with that actual on the ground and leadership experience in this entire field. All right, all right we'll play. Um, uh, just reports this week say ISIS is making a comeback in uh, Syria and Iraq. What is the solution there? Uh, you have on the ground experience, and what should the U.S. and the West strategy be moving forward? And I read that report actually on the, the plane ride down here this morning, and it's concerning because the mistake that we made in Iraq, and I was an open critic of this at the time, was that we were, withdrew our troops so quickly and without a plan that we had to turn around and send them all back 12 months later. I spent three years of my life on the ground in the Middle East. There's no one who wants to bring the troops home more than I do. But I want to bring them home for good. I don't want to bring them home and have to turn around and send them back a year or two later. So we've got to have a plan, not just to get the troops out, but to actually end the war. And from my experience, what that means is that you don't withdraw on a timeline, you withdraw based on the security situation, and every time you take troops out, you reinforce the diplomatic presence in these countries so that their governments can do their job. You know, when ISIS swept into Iraq from Syria, they didn't just defeat the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army put their weapons down and went home because they've lost faith in their own government. So the solution there is not just to train Iraqi troops, it's to strengthen the Iraqi government. But that's what we continually fail to do. We don't have any plan in Syria for a government. We don't even know what government we're fighting for. And in Afghanistan, we don't have, we hardly have any diplomats there. We can be negotiating with the Taliban, but what does that actually mean if we don't strengthen the Afghan government? So the point is that you lead with diplomacy and you make sure that the troops know what their mission is, what government they're fighting to install so that they can come home and actually come home for good. Uh, like Charleston, your congressional district is a coastal one that loves its seafood. Uh, 
fisheries in your home state were negatively affected by the tariffs. The lobster fishermen up there are just in, in bad straits. What is your plan to address the trade wars and tariffs? You know, my plan to address Trump's trade war is to end Trump's trade war. Because it's stupid, okay? This, this is not the way to conduct foreign policy, all right? Um, you, you, don't, you don't tweet real estate offers for Greenland. You don't throw around tariffs not having any understanding of how they're gonna affect your farmers, your fishermen, your American families as consumers back here at home. And yet that's what Trump has been doing. Now we do have to confront China. And I have a robust plan to do so, starting with building a Pacific version of NATO to formalize and strengthen the alliances that we have in the Pacific. We have a lot of allies like uh, South Korea, Japan that don't actually get along very well. And we need to prevent, present a united front, both against China and against, against North Korea. And that's some of the, that's what I mean by meeting with diplomacy. That's some of the diplomatic work that we need to do. We shouldn't be afraid of the World Trade Organization, which Trump seems to be afraid of. Uh, the Obama administration brought, up, brought about a dozen cases against China before the WTO, and every single one of them that's been decided has been decided in our favor. So we shouldn't be afraid of that. And at the end of the day, we've got to stop China from stealing our business ideas and our military secrets from the internet every single day. And you don't do that by just throwing a bunch of terrorists at them. You do that by constructing the cyber defenses that we need to, take to keep America safe. This administration has allocated more money for a southern border wall than for cyber defenses for the entire country. That doesn't make any sense. And getting some trade deal with China because of these tariff threats is not gonna make any sense either. And the last thing is that there was a lot of pol political opposition on both sides of the aisle to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we had some legitimate concerns. I had some concerns about the enforceability of the environmental and labor protections in that, in, that, in that deal. But what Trump has done is just turned his back on the entire process and pulled out entirely. And as a result, China is starting to set the trade rules for the Pacific. That's wrong. America should continue to set the rules of the road for trade in the Pacific. And we do that by negotiating our own trade deals and by leading on that. My foreign policy, writ large, is America should win wars without fighting them. Use diplomacy to prevent us from ever having to send troops into combat. Of course, what we're doing right now is the exact opposite. We're fighting wars without winning them. So we really gotta turn that around. We've taken some questions from you guys in the audience, and I appreciate that because it helps us as reporters and journalists make sure that we're asking questions that matter to you. This question, I hope I say your name right. If not, please yell at me immediately. Um, it comes from Moscono, did I say? Okay, great. Um, the first question um, coming from Maz is about gun control. Should we focus more on Wayne LaPierre instead of the NRA? Look, whether you're focusing on the NRA leadership or you're focusing on the NRA, it doesn't really matter. What, what's important is that we take the NRA out of the politics here because the NRA is controlling Republican politics right now. And so what I've encouraged people to do, uh, not just fellow politicians, but Americans who say, I just wanna make a difference. It's, you know, go support all organizations that are against the NRA, you know, that are just saying that we need an alternative voice in this, in this conversation. The kind of gun laws that, we're, that I'm supportive of, that we're talking about passing, are, su are supported by the vast majority of Americans. Universal background checks is supported by over 95% of Americans. You know, I had a, a more controversial bill in the last Congress to prevent terrorists from buying guns. And by more controversial, I mean that rather than 95% support, it has about 90% support. Okay, that's not 90% support among liberal Democrats. That's just 97% support of Americans, of all political parties. The NRA is against this stuff. The NRA was against my bill to ban bump stocks, the single most bipartisan gun reform bill that Congress has seen in, in modern history, and yet they've banned bump stocks from their own headquarters because they don't think they're safe. So this is just utter political hypocrisy. 
And what we've got to say to Americans, to Republicans, to Democrats, is that it's the job of members of Congress to do the right thing by their constituents, not the right thing by the lobbyists at the NRA. The second question comes from the gentleman in the front, Brian Simmons, who I spoke with personally. He's an OIF veteran, just look at his hat. Um, we spoke and he told me that he's noticed that veterans like himself and others are entering the workforce and seem to have higher rates of unemployment and also struggle with mental health issues, which you yourself have spoken about personally. But what are your plans or incentives for programs like Troops to Teacher, like Hire Hero under Bush, that helps with that transition from military life and service into the workforce? Um, do you want to see a plan where the military is going to specific sectors? Just tell, tell us about that. Yeah. Here you go. Thank you, Kate. Um, and Brian, thank you very much for the question. It's a great question because I think it goes to the heart of the issue. If you look at veterans across America, veterans are disproportionately successful in business, in, 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 in politics. I mean, veterans have higher lifetime earn earnings on average than, than, than other non-veteran Americans. But veterans also have higher rates of suicide, higher rates of homelessness. So how is it that you have some veterans doing exceptionally well and some veterans literally living on the street. Well, I think it all comes back to the transition. Because either you're able to take this extraordinary, life-changing leadership experience for the military and apply it to success back here at home, or you just don't simply navigate that transition well and you fall off the cliff. So when I am asked about veterans homelessness or veterans health care or whatever else, I really try to focus on, on navigating that transition well. And for a lot of veterans, it's getting the simple mental health care that they need to just get past post-traumatic stress, like I was able to do. You know, post-traumatic stress is something that I experienced when I came home. But in a story I've now told publicly for the first time, I sought help. I went and talked to someone. And I've been able to manage it successfully. And as a result of that, here I am running for president as a United States Congressman. I think it's made me a stronger leader. I think it's made me a better father to my little girl. I think it matters that unlike any other candidate in this race, the first time I have to make a life or death decision involving the lives of young Americans won't be when I'm sitting in the Situation Room of the White House and live with the consequences of that decision. But a lot of veterans come back and they just don't get that care. They don't ever get to address their post-traumatic stress and learn how to manage it. And so I have the most ambitious mental health care plan of any, not only presidential candidate in this race, but I think any presidential candidate period. And it's a three-part plan. The first part is to say to every veteran, if you come back from a combat zone, you're gonna get a mental health appointment within two weeks and every single year thereafter. And that'll apply to everybody uh, in the military to set an example that mental health care should be rut as routine as physical health care. You know, no one gets embarrassed if they say, hey, I gotta go to get my physical. You, know, you, don't, you don't respond to that by saying, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Well, that should be the case with a mental health care appointment as well. An annual checkup just to make sure you're okay. And by the way, if you're fine, then the doctor might say, well, hey, have you tried mindfulness? Have you tried mental meditation? Have you considered yoga? These are practices that our elite special forces troops are now adopting because it makes them mentally stronger. And that should be the case for everybody in America. Just like you go to get an annual physical and the doctor says, hey, you're fine, but are you working out? Are you eating well? You know, these are questions we should ask. The second part of the proposal is to extend that to every high schooler in America. High schoolers are facing a rise of mental health issues because of school shootings, because of the effects of social media. I want to make it so routine in America to get a mental health exam that everybody, just like you get your annual physical, just like you get your teeth cleaned, it's, yeah, I'm going in for my annual mental health checkup. And high schoolers can help set that example for younger kids and, and, and for adults. And then the third part is to establish a nationwide three-digit 911 type code for anyone to call and seek mental health assistance. So whether you're contemplating suicide, you're a veteran who's dealing with post-traumatic stress, you're just someone who you know, had a tough time with their parents and you need to talk to a therapist, you can call this number and get connected to help. 
And it should be an easy to remember number because you know when your house is burning down and you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't have time to go look up the local fire department number in the, in, in the phone book. That's why we have 911. Well, if you're thinking about jumping off a bridge, you should just know that there's a three-digit number you can call. And the great part of this three-part proposal is that two of the third three parts I've already been able to start moving forward in Congress just in the past couple months. Just this week, we are announcing that that three-digit code will be 988, and we have a bipartisan bill that we've introduced in Congress together with a Republican veteran from the Air Force. Uh, to make this uh, a nationwide standard. On the first part, as, as part of the new national defense bill, we have established a standard, a new standard, that that two week period, that if you come back from a combat zone, you'll get seen by a mental health professional within two weeks, and that'll be across the board for the United States military. So it's not only an ambitious proposal, but it's an achievable proposal, and we're making progress on it today. What about the workforce side of it? <laughs> Well, there's a lot to do on the workforce side as well, and there's a great there, there's a lot of great programs. Um, Helmets to Hard Hats is an example of a, of a union-backed program that's taking people with military skills and putting them to work um, in uh, in jobs like being machinists, uh, you know, pipe fitters, and the pipe fitters is a great program with this, uh, for example. You know, th these are these are things that, that we've got to support. But I don't want to tell any veteran, like, this is what you have to do. You know, just because you have experience with, with tools doesn't mean you need to be a machinist. I want every veteran to come back and know that he or she will have the care that they need, the care that they've earned, the best health care in America, because that's exactly what we should give to every person who's risked his or her life for this country. And also, whatever job opportunity they want. We're going to move on to our lightning round, which I think is probably my favorite so far. Um, and it's just going to be a series of questions, some of them lighter, some of them maybe a little... Some light, some heavy? Maybe some light, some heavy. But uh, in 2003, uh, you were on a TV show in Iraq uh, with your Iraqi interpreter, and it was called Bolton and Muhammad. Can you tell us about your favorite episode? <coughs> and you can't use the one that you told Seth Meyer. You can't do it. I don't remember which one I told Seth Meyer. <laughs> Oh, no, I do. Yes. That was a good one. Yeah. You know, I mean, the most popular episode was, it was sort of like a, like a news uh, investigative journalism, sort of like a mini 60 Minutes. And we just asked really tough questions and found answers to them. And our single most popular show, I don't know if this is my favorite or not, but our most popular show was when we just said, you know, why, why is there no power in Iraq? And we went around and started asking questions and went to the power plant, went to the switching station and started just doing investigative journalism to tell Iraqis this is why you don't have electricity in your homes. And they had never seen anything like that before. Because all they ever got was Baghdad Bob and the Ministry of Information pumping out propaganda from Saddam Hussein. So it was kind of a surreal experience uh, delivering a free media, a free press to Iraq for the first time. And, and we in the Marine Corps thought that that was an essential component of a democracy. I mean, if this were Trump's war, he'd probably just you know install the, the, the Baghdad version of Fox News and, 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 and that would be it, just state media is telling you what the, the president wants you to hear. But that's not what we believe in the Marine Corps. We said a free press is important, asking tough questions of the, of the government, and that's exactly what we established. Did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy doing my job? <laughs> so I was more of a celebrity then than I was now, than I am now. Um, I mean, you know, having a popular TV show meant that I was getting fan mail, I was signing autographs in the streets, I mean, uh, it was, uh, it was quite the experience for a 24-year-old in Iraq. All right, second question. JFK or Tip O'Neill? Well, I, Tip O'Neill was a great political strategist and an, an implementer. I mean, the, the, the Nancy Pelosi of his day and very good at the job. Um, but I like aspirational leadership. Uh, I, I like ambitious leadership. You know, it was, took a lot of ambition for JFK to say, we're going to go to the moon by the end of this decade. It talk, uh, took a lot of ambition to, to start to tackle civil rights issues uh, in the 1960s. And, and, and I think that's the kind of principled leadership that we need in America today. What is the best food that you've had in South Carolina? Please be specific. I had a shrimp burger today. Where from? And I've never had a shrimp burger before um, at a place called the Fish House across the bridge. And uh, it was 
I, I didn't really know what I was going to get. It said, it said fried fish made into a, fried shrimp made into a burger. I didn't know if it was going to be like a bunch of them. They're all going to be falling out of the bun or whatever. Um, they kind of mashed it all up, fried it as one big glob, and it was very tasty. What book of fiction did you read in your 20s that has stayed with you? I think I read, I read Huck Finn in my 20s. It may not be the only time I've read it. But, you know, a Huck Finn is an American classic that has been often derided because of some of the racist, racism in it and whatnot. But actually, I think that it's an important American classic because it forces us to confront some of those issues. And we obviously still need to confront those issues today. I understand that you're also an author in the making. Um, your book, entitled Called to Serve, Learning to Lead in War and Peace, will be out in 2021. Is that still the case? Let me just make sure of yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I've been putting it on hold because of this campaign, but um, <laughs> I, you know, at the right time, I'll get back to it. Okay. Which Washington leaders will you be sending early copies to? Which Washington leaders? Mm -hmm. Well, before it even comes out, General McChrystal is offered to review the book. And General McChrystal, of course, is a celebrated uh, military leader. He is uh, the only general officer, to my knowledge, that's made any endorsement in this entire presidential campaign, and I'm very proud to have received his endorsement. Um, he talked about my character and leadership and said, this is the person that I want to be the next president of the United States, and that, that means a lot to me. Um, it's not just because of my views on foreign policy or in my views in the Middle East, it's, um, it's because of the things that we should be talking about in this, this race. What kind of leader are you going to be for the, uh, for the country? So uh, he's going to get a copy of the book before it even comes out. And then who will get it after? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Caitlin, you started by praising your boss. I mean, I guess you, know, you, you said it to the, <coughs> to, the, to, the, to the people in charge of Washington and say, um, you know, uh, Trump isn't exactly my boss, but he is the President of the United States, and I think you can learn a little bit about principled leadership. All right, we'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming tonight, and also the folks at Palmetto Brewery for hosting us. Um, these are going real well. We don't have anyone immediately scheduled for September, but we've gotten a lot of interest for October, so just stay um, in tune. We may have some September people. Um, the candidates want to be here. If you want to see them, we're going to try to make it happen. We will keep putting stuff out on our web page and just stay interested. So we're going to wrap it up, but we will give the congressman the last two minutes. Skylar and Caleb, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody. Thanks for coming up. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be back in, uh, in South Carolina. This race is about a lot of things. And you're going to hear talk candidates talk about, about health care, about the economy, about climate change. But fundamentally, it's about who we are as a country. You know, what values do, do we represent? And whether we're going to be a country that looks backwards, make America great again, to some mythic past that never really existed, or looks forward and says, let's make America better than it's ever been before. And let's make everybody be a part of that mission. That's what my campaign is about. You won't hear me promise a whole bunch of free stuff. You're not gonna get a thousand dollar check every month for doing nothing. You're gonna have to work a little bit if you wanna get free college. You're gonna have to work a little bit to pay off your loans, although I don't want that to be a burden for anyone. I just paid off my last college loan and I'm starting to work on grad school now. But what I will ask you is to believe in this country, to believe in America and in our values so much that you're willing to step up and serve America to make it better for every single one of us to do our part, to remember what our values are all about, and to remember the great good that we can do for the world and for everybody right here at home if we're willing to serve our country and make it better. It's through service that America has met all of our greatest challenges. It's how we climbed out of the Great Depression. It's how we won World War II. It's how we tackled civil rights in the 1950s. It's how we sent a man to the moon. It's by calling Americans to serve that we can recognize our greatest potential as a country. But that's what my campaign is about. That's what I think we need to do to win this election. And ultimately, and most importantly, that's what we need to do to move this country forward when we do. Thanks very much for having me.